icon. If we could add ourselves in the audience, that'll be great because we're about to start with our uh, first speaker for this track. We have uh, Kristen. Uh, Kristen is a data scientist working on big data analytics at HP Labs Singapore. Uh, she's using Python for text mining, machine learning, and data stream processing. And she's going to talk to you about real-time stream processing with Python. Kristen. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming to join uh, the talk today. Um, just a brief um, a, a introduction about myself. Um, I'm Kristen. I'm working at HP Labs as a data scientist. Um, to be honest, I'm uh, not a Python experience user. Um, most of my previous experience was uh, in high performance computing, and what I did most um, was with uh, C and CUDA programming for GPU. So, um, so, but, um, but even during that time, uh, for most of the machine learning and data analytics job, that um, because I was doing some uh, uh, DNA processing back then, and um, uh, when it comes to performance, I'll go to C++, but for quick prototyping and uh, quick development of our goals and idea, I would um, go to either Python or R, depending on my need. So, um, so um, and uh, currently at HP Labs, where most of my team members are actually using Java. So, um, so of, uh, the uh, uh, one and few adopter of uh, Python over there, but um, but personally, I uh, I I love Python. It's it's great for quick prototyping, and um, and recently I have been uh, started working with uh, with Apache Storm, and and um, and uh, to do to use pa Storm for data analytics, especially for text data. I find that it's it's very useful. To, to, to use uh, Python in this context. So, um, so today, the purpose of the talk is I'm gonna talk a bit more about stream processing in general, um, because there are a lot of technologies these days, um, Spark, Kafka, Storm, uh, Samza. So um, when, when, you, you, um, when you start considering doing a stream processing task, you have a lot of choices. So I, um, so that's why, at first, I would want to give a general guideline to stream processing um, so that um, depending on your uh, personal need, you, you would choose the corresponding technology. For me, I chose Storm, but you, you might uh, choose uh, some other stuff. So, um, so this is the main topics I'm going to talk about. Um, this at first, I'll talk about uh, the A rules of stream processing. Uh, this part m might be a bit boring, but I find it extremely important, and um, so that we need to know these concepts uh, before we actually go into uh, a particular stream processing framework. And um, subsequently, uh, more exciting stuff would be the um, open source software stack that I have used um, to. Um, so for text analytics streaming processing uh, from, uh, from the input side to the processing uh, and out to the visualization side. So um, the three main components of uh, this stack would be Apache Storm, um, the ELK stack, uh, the main components I use would yeah, Elasticsearch and Kipana, and um, the, the main purpose of it is to visualize the streaming results. Um, for uh, Python-related components, I use the following modules, Pilots, uh, the Elasticsearch module to connect to Elasticsearch, and uh, text blob and LTK and stuff for, for the text processing component. So, um, so, I just want to briefly go through the, some of the typical use cases that, uh, that why stream processing is, is getting a lot of attention these days, especially in these two, three years. Um, because, because uh, like as people know, we have more data, more streaming data, and then 
and then uh, we have enough power to process in these in real time. So um, it, it has a lot of use cases in, um, as I say, uh, trading. Uh, the number 122,000 messages per second in 2005 was um, was a number reported back then and uh, predicted doubling every year. So uh, I would estimate it would be 125 million messages per second uh, now in 2015. Um, in finance and telco, we've seen a lot of uh, fraud detection applications as well. And for these, you want to get a response as soon as possible. As, as soon as you, uh, somebody's wiped the credit card and it's illegal, um, you would want to, to report to the bank, alert to the bank or alert to the customer as soon as possible. So um, uh, a lot of uh, fraud detection uh, in finance previously was done in a batch like of thing where uh, they did a processing um, either daily or every two days or something like that because because uh, the the facilities back then couldn't keep up with the real time uh, input stream coming in so now we sort of can address this type of problems um, another thing you see every day is online advertising personalized ads as, as I mean when you go to a website you would have seen that especially like on Google's mails and stuff like that, you see personal ad, personalized ads for, uh, and then when you go to news site, you read the news and then it pop up something that's related to your interest real time. So that would be one application as well. Um, computer network monitoring security attacks and stuff like that. Um, the purpose is similar to fraud detection in finance. Um, manufacturing process control and automation in, in HP, we actually have um, automation, uh, the manufacturing side, which give a lot of logs data from you know, printers, manufacturing and stuff like that. And, and there is need to, to process these and give alert as, as soon as like some parts not working correctly or something like that. So, um, so if you can alert to the technician as soon as possible, then, then it would be great as well. Um, and, and finally, uh, a lot of um, things that we see these days um, are sensor networks um, application. And especially in, uh, in Singapore with the Smart Nation uh, project, um, we're, we're trying to integrate all these, um, these uh, resources, um, these data from traffic data, weather data, a lot of uh, various data to give like live um, alert to uh, your, the user on traffic condition or something like that. So, so this is a big, big view for for stream applications. Um, okay, so uh, now to the boring part. Uh, sorry uh, if if it bores you, but um, I'll, I'll try to keep it as um, as uh, interesting as possible. But I I find that these eight rules, which are uh, devised not by me but by a very famous guy uh, in database, Michael Stonebreaker. If, if you know, uh, if you happen to know him. So um, he's done a lot in, in the field of database and stream processing. And I find these eight rules are extremely important when you look at um, stream processing frameworks. So let's go through them one by one. The first one is um, you want to keep the data moving. So what, what does it mean by that is that um, for stream processing, you don't want storage. Um, you want to store for some other purposes, but you don't want to ha have a stream coming in, you write somewhere, and then you and then there's another thing to come and query that. Uh, for, for processing, you don't want that. You want a flow, no storage in the middle if you want real-time response. Um, so uh, an, active, an active processing model would be preferred as well. You, in other words, you want no polling stuff. You want the push pay. Uh, model, not not the polling thing. Um, so as soon as the data or the message or the tuple is ready, it should go through the, your stream framework. It should the the later components in um, in the framework shouldn't go shouldn't have to poll to to know when the message comes in. The second important thing is um, the stream should allow some sort of window operations. So um, 
because uh, most of the time we're, we're not only interested in the, the operation happened at this particular second, but some of the time you would be interested in like um, what happened in the past uh, five minutes, in the past 10 minutes, in the past 10 seconds or something like that. So the framework should be flexible enough to give you that, um, that sort of, of operations. So all these filter, merge, correlate, aggregate on streams. Um, and, uh, and if more, even better is it allows you to extend these operations according to your specific need. Um, the third rule, the third requirement is it should be able to handle stream imperfections. Delay, missing out of order messages, these things you, um, from the data sources, not something you can control. So, so ideally, the, the framework itself should handle these imperfections uh, or have a mechanism to cope with these imperfections. Um, the fourth point is to generate predictable outcomes. So, um, so sort of correlate with the previous point is that it should be able to generate correct and predictable outcomes no matter, no matter what happens to the message streams. So, um, so ideally it should have this characteristics and uh, the ability to support fault tolerance and recovery replay in when you uh, encounter some faulty or out of order messages are, um, is important as well. The fifth point is ideally it should integrate store and streaming data. Um, streaming application normally can, um, for most of the application I've seen, it's rarely go alone. So normally it's go hand in hand with uh, some historical query. So, um, so you want to do something real life and then to put it somewhere and then maybe in one, every hour, uh, every day you go to the storage and you do some batch analytics on, on top of it. So, so um, if a stream engine has this ability to sort of seamlessly integrate these two components, then, then it, it would be, it would make your, your life much easier than um, if it doesn't have that. The sixth point is to guarantee data safety and availability. So, um, so things like hot backup and real-time failover scheme and stuff like that. What, what if your, your um, processing <coughs> server die or something like that? So, so ideally the framework can you know, fail over or, or uh, enable a second backup system to keep running because most of these real-time application, especially from the banking industry, telcos and stuff like that, they can't, um, they can't Manage to to tolerate uh, total failover is is a, a total no. So if if the framework does not support that, it's, it's very hard to be adopted in these these um, industries. The seventh uh, point, which is sort of important to all the big data application these days, to the ability to partition and scale automatically. So if the framework handles that for you, it's, it's easy. You just need to care about the, the, um, the logic and the processing step. You don't have to just care about all this. If, if you were to do scaling up your services, it would be um, much tougher. And the final thing is um, come, it comes with the latency of the the processing um, operation. So ideally, it should give you process and respond instantaneously. So this is a very relative term. Uh, people talk about near real time, real time. In, in, my, in my definition back then, when I was working with GBU and stuff, it should be like split. It, it should be really quick. It's, but um, when it comes to the, uh, the speed data and Hadoop and this kind of thing, so I sort of relaxed that. Uh, that uh, latency a bit, but uh, yeah, you should uh, you should expect around like sub second sub second latency second something around there would be uh, good enough for most applications I've seen. So yeah, to sum so to sum up, um, these are the eight rules that a a re uh, an ideal stream engine or uh, stream streaming processing framework should have. Um, 
uh, when so so when you look at uh, all the solution out there, not not just the big data and open sourcing, all the rules engines, or the uh, main memory uh, DBMS, which can be used for stream processing as well. So uh, when you look at these, you see how many of these rules are satisfied by this solution, and and I find that it's very useful to use this as a, a guideline and see. Oh, and, and at least you know that oh, if it doesn't support such a, like query on stream window operations, um, for example, then you wouldn't would need um, uh, other components to cover for that part. Uh, so a very useful guideline. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, there are three main categories of stream processing solutions. Not only these days. Uh, Actually, this kind of thing has been uh, done, I think, uh, 40, 50 years ago. There have been papers and people working on these things. So the three main categories are main memory DBMS, um, as in they're quick enough, so you can, can um, allow you to do these uh, you know, quick and subsequent latency processing type of thing. The second are uh, rules engines. Um, I've seen a lot in the industry, people are using rule engines. And, um, and the third type, which is quite a popular these days, are stream uh, processing engines. So, um, so this is just a recap of how these, um, these different solutions uh, correspond to the eight requirements that we have seen just now. Um, and for no, Y for yes, and uh, P for possible, and D is sort of uh, not impossible, but would be difficult to, to have. And, um, and as you see from the list, um, main memory DBMS is not really a general uh, choice for stream processing, unless you have specific need, or unless you have some existing technology and stuff like that, because it would be difficult to handle stream perfections, difficult to pre to, ha to ensure predictable uh, outcomes, and the keep data moving type thing, you know, push based type of thing is not ensured by memory DBMS at all. So um, when you look at stream processing, I would recommend to look at either rule engines or stream uh, processing engines. And um, as in, you can see the yes and no over here. I think the main difference is this one, the SQL style processing queries on stream and uh, integrate store and stream, uh, store and streaming data processing. So these are the two main points. So if you don't need these, you can, yeah, go ahead and use uh, rule engines. If you need these, maybe you want to look at stream processing engines. So, um, so this is a recent project that I have been working on, uh, um, um, which use Apache Storm. Um, there are some others popular thing uh, as well. The main rival would be Spark Streaming, but um, from my point of view, I think the main uh, the main difference is that if you want to do some processing on um, when so stream of data, right? Message comes by message. If you want that kind of message by message processing. Uh, Storm would be a safe choice. Um, Spark streaming, uh, we want to talk, uh, part of Sp uh, Apache Spark, we want to talk about Hadoop. Then um, it sort of work in a micro batch type of thing. So, so if you, if you you're looking at the uh, uh, micro batch, or um, then then um, Spark streaming might be more appropriate. But for for message by message, I would recommend Apache Storm. And there are other um, projects as well, Apache uh, Kafka, uh, developed and and some are developed side by side by LinkedIn, and um, all of these are an open source solution. So uh, I mean they're free to use, which is a very good thing. So um, so uh, since uh, I decided to adopt uh, Apache Storm. Um, and I was targeted some text streaming analysis type thing. I, I was looking particularly some very popular thing like sentiment analysis and uh, text parsing and web scraping and stuff like that. So I and I found previously in my previously uh, my previous experience that it's very easy to to do these sort of text 
um, whatever processing with Python. So I was looking to see if uh, there's a way that I can combine these two and provide the end user with the streaming results, um, you know, nicely. So I, um, so at the end, I picked these three: Apache Storm, Palias, which is a, a module, a Python module developed by Yelp. Uh, you know, YELP, the um, review site, um, which allows you to develop storm topologies um, in Python. Um, actually, Apache Storm can support any type of languages. Uh, uh, it's, it's most easy to do with Java. That's, that's normally what people do, but you can, do, can, you can use with um, other languages itself. Um, without even without Palias, but then Palias is a, a Python package that make um, sort of make the the development and uh, easier for you rather than you do uh, uh, Java and then calling Python kind of thing uh, in in uh, Storm Core. So um, and the third one is the ELK stack, Elasticsearch, mainly Elasticsearch and Kibana to sort of. Uh, have some storage of historical data as well. And then uh, Kibana will pick up from Elasticsearch and show the real-time uh, streaming result. So I, uh, I did a, a bit more on how the eight rules for stream processing apply to Apache Storm. Um, so as you have seen here, um, except for the yes for all of the um, one no is the query on streams. So um, this is uh, not something Storm support um, natively. So if you want that, you have to write the processing component yourself. Or um, for me, I sort of, there one workaround for me is that I have the, uh, some, most of the raw data written in Elasticsearch. And um, for my requirement, Elasticsearch is quick enough so that I can do some sort of query uh, and give in live results as well. So uh, that is my workaround for the, that missing feature from Storm. The five, and, and yeah, as, uh, it doesn't have a store uh, data thing, so it's not really, other than that, all the other um, all the other requirements are satisfied by Storm. So uh, it will handle all the scaling things for you and then handle data failure for tolerance and stuff like that. So you, don't, you really don't need to care. Um, you, you would have a reliable streaming framework. You just need to care about how you process uh, each of the message coming in from the stream only. Um, okay, so, so that's it for the A rules. Um, uh, my, my only recommendation is that you use it to evaluate whatever uh, streaming framework that you're considering to use and you're aware of the uh, advantage and disadvantage of each technology. Um, yeah. Now I would like to talk a bit more about Storm because uh, this is the main, the key streaming component. Um, so uh, in Storm, um, a message, uh, these are all the abstractions used in Storm to, to um, so that uh, you can, can think of your operations in terms of these abstractions and it, it makes it uh, easier to develop uh, Storm applications. Uh, first is a tuple. A, a tuple is an uh, immutable list of key and value pairs so uh, when you write the code, you define um, um, a tuple, which is a message in there, how many fields would you have? Each field has a name. And then when the message comes, you know, oh, okay, uh, this value is this field and something like that. A stream is an unbounded sequence of tuples. So, so it doesn't have an end. It will keep coming unless you stop the application. Um, and there's a... Uh, these terms are specific to Storm. Uh, first term is spout. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, it's used to refer to the source of the stream. And it's normally uh, the first component in a Storm topology, so-called Storm topology. The second is a bolt, which is a processing unit which process tools and produce a new output stream. So only two main components, only spout and bolt, data source and processing unit. 
then um, a topology would be a network of spouts and bolts. See, uh, each of these components will produce a uh, downstream stream. So, so how um, so how these these streams are connected get uh, connected together is defined by the topology graph. How you connect? Um, a toss is a running instance of a, a spout or a bolt, and stream groupings as um, refers to how the tuples are sent between uh, the tasks. So I'll give you an illustration to, so normally you, there are storm topologies called, a storm application is uh, defined in the storm topology and it will look something like this. Um, as, as in a, the spout, spout um, which takes in input from queues, databases, uh, API calls, um, like Twitter streams, stuff like that. And then um, it, it will give out a uh, downstream uh, two boards and then go to a board and then go to another board. Um, this is a simple topology graph. Uh, a topology is a directed acyclic graph and it, it, but it doesn't have to, it doesn't need to have only one spout. You can have multiple spout come in here, here as well. You can have um, two spouts connected to one board and stuff like that. As long as your, your logic in there can handle it, then, um, then it doesn't really restrict on how many board, boards or how many spouts you have. Uh, as long as the topology is a directed acyclic graph, then um, in any uh, configuration is, is acceptable. Um, and uh, so, um, a little bit on on the parallelism done by used by Storm. So, uh, so a Storm uh, application will spawn um, a number of JVMs. Uh, so you have a number of machines, right, connected into a Storm clusters, and then on each machine you have a number of JVMs, and then in each JVM it can run multiple threads called executors. And then in here, in, in each executor, executor, you would have one or more spout or bolt tasks. And a uh, reminder, task is a running instance of a spout or bolt. So this, this is the whole, um, I think this, so the, the whole basic idea of, of storm parallelism. And the nice thing about storm is that you, um, you don't have to know about all of this. Actually, what you need to do is that just to say, oh, I have this uh, bolt, I have this spout, uh, they connect like this, and I want this spout to be run using uh, five threads, so I say all the other ones using 10 threads. You just give that number, and all of these spawning JVM tasks, whatever, is done automatically by Storm. And they will take into the configuration of your Storm cluster config as well. So, so this is one thing I, I really like about Storm, uh, especially what coming from the CUDA point of view where I have to handle all these myself. So, so this, this is a, a big plus if, if you want to do parallel processing and you don't have to worry about this. Um, this is an, an overview of uh, Storm clusters and components. So um, Storm sort of require uh, Apache Zookeeper to do the coordination between the the running in, um, the machines in the Storm clusters, and then you uh, from Storm point of view, you would have one main process called the Nimbus, which is um, the the Nimbus, which is sort of like the job tracker in Hadoop, where it uh, it would do all the job distribution and things. You have a, a process called Storm UI, which allows you to monitor all the Storm topologies running at the moment and see see the latency, see the throughput of each component, and and from there you can identify like uh, which one is really running slow, and you might want to optimize that one. So the Storm UI is very useful. Um, there are other uh, supervisor processes. Um, these are like task trackers in Hadoop and. Um, to distribute the, the task to the JVMs. So, um, so that's like, so in order to set up Storm, normal, uh, first you need to have Zookeeper installed, set running, and then you would have Storm installed, and then you would run these three, pro three main processes, uh, the Nimbus, UI, and Supervisor, and then um, the 
these um, processes are sort of fail fast processes, tough things. So you would, uh, for me, I would install a supervisor D, uh, daemon as well to start these processes uh, in case they fail. So, um, so yeah, so this is how to develop a storm project um, with either Python Pilots or even with Java. So first you set up a storm, uh, a storm cluster from scratch. Um, it, it doesn't rely on uh, um, Hadoop or anything. So the three, the two essential components: the storm, Apache Storm, and Apache Zookeeper. Uh, you, um, but normally I would recommend supervisor this as well, or anything equivalent to to restart the three main storm processes in case they fail. And um, so, how to develop and test? Then for, for storm topology, you can test them locally. You can run them locally as in, in one JVM just for testing purpose. And then when, after testing um, successfully, then you would uh, submit it to the storm cluster where the processes are spawned and stuff like that. So um, it's very easy. Uh, actually, especially with Pylos, it's a, a bit more lengthy with Java, but with, with Python, it is very easy. So uh, for the spout, which um, um, Pylos already uh, identified, then you just need to implement actually the next tuple method in there. It initialize to do some one-time init in the beginning. If you don't have, then just implement it uh, next tuple. In that next tuple, it will um, normally you will define the logic what the storm component should do every time a new message comes in. Just that. So you imagine, oh, every time a new message comes in with these fields, what I, what I want to do with each of them. Then you, you write into the next tuple method. Uh, similar for both, uh, just a different name called process tool. And then, um, and then to identify the connection between these components, uh, topology itself, you, you define these in a YAML config file. Uh, which is very clear and very easy to understand. And then you compile uh, using uh, the command pilots build. Um, if you use Java, it has a, a similar command, storm view or something like that. Then you run in local mode uh, using pilots local. And then when you're satisfied with your logic and stuff, everything, then you would submit it to an actual storm cluster for it to run, and then you use the storm UI to monitor these processes. Um, so just a quick, um, a quick overview of the YAML configuration file. This is to define the topology. So in here, I sort of did a Twitter uh, sentiment processing type thing. So in here is, I have a spout and a bolt. And I have a few more as well, but for illustration, I have a spout and bolt over here. And then uh, I just need to give it a name. The module is sort of the file name to that Python class. Then um, parallelism hint is sort of how many threads I want to run this component on. and. Uh, it has some options for you to have some user-defined configs, uh, similar for the boat. So, see, it's it's very straightforward here. In in Java, you would need uh, to write all of these in uh, topology class, so it's sort of uh, not that hard, but lengthier and, and harder to see. That's all. So, I really prefer this Pylos uh, style. Um, this is an example of a spout in here. This is a Twitter spout where I call the Twitter API to get the incoming tweets. As you know, Twitter has these streaming APIs which either give you 1% um, of the global tweets coming in or uh, you can track um, by certain location or you can follow certain people and stuff like that and, have, and, and analyze their tweets uh, in real time. So this is the Twitter spell, which um, I would like to highlight the two main components. Is this one, the output fields here, which is you just need to define this list in advance, like the name of the fields that you're going to have in each message. And, um, and these fields is, will correlate to this 
emit function over here, self-emit, where you actually define the value of these fields that you define above. So the, the main components are just these. Uh, you define the output fields, and then uh, after processing, you emit this value um, correspondingly. Then, then you have a stream flowing through this Twitter spell. Uh, in here, I got this initialized function as well to do some uh, in set of uh, Twitter credentials and stuff like that. So um, this is an example of the bot. Uh, in this bot, I don't have any uh, initialization done. So there's, as I said, there's only this method that you need to write process tool. And same similar concept, you just need to, to see um, what sort of output field you uh, want to emit to the next bot and then you write the actual emit function. And um, it has this, uh, this line over here is to get the stream from the previous uh, component, either a spell or bolt. So by uh, storing these two values here. So yeah, that's it. Uh, if you want to do a very basic Twitter function, you just need to write spell uh, next to all, bolt, process tool, and then write that YAML file with a few lines there, then, then you got your streaming application ready to run. Um, so some of the, uh, the development guidelines that I would like to recommend uh, that I encountered during development is that um, uh, general guideline, each component should perform a light computation. You don't want a heavy computation. Why? Because if the uh, computation is heavy, the latency at that component will be very high. And then it's sort of like uh, a queue, a queue, right? If you queue at a food store, for example, and then if that person prepares, take a very long time, then it would be a long queue, right? Then it would, would really increase the latency of your whole process. So actually, you want to keep the latency at each component as low as possible, ideally zero or something like that, 0 0.00 something millisecond. Um, error handling is critical. Uh, as in, you need to test and make sure that each component works correctly, because otherwise, if when running, it, it, um, if it stops, if one of the components fails, it will stop the whole stream flow, uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, flow, storm topology. And then if it's a real production thing, uh, you, you would encounter loss of data, and, and that's not what you want. So error handling is particularly critical in, um, for storm topologies. And then um, uh, one guideline for scaling up, the thing is that you would want to test, tune uh, the operations, and scale each individual com component first. And then, so using some simulated uh, spell or balls or something like that, scale each of them, and then you put them together and scale the whole topology. It, it, uh, um, rather than you do everything in one run, it would make it harder. So for performance tuning, um, uh, all these configuration can be done in Storm. So you can config the number of machines, the number of workers, the number of threads or ex executors, and the number of component tasks you want to run. Um, Storm had internal built-in reliability settings as well, and if you don't really need, if you can, uh, if you can manage to lose a few uh, messages and you're still okay with it, then you might want to turn that off or something like that to increase performance. And uh, the stream grouping type, where uh, which tuple should send to which task and stuff like that, then you want to optimize that part as well. So these are the three components uh, tuning. And uh, of course, the topology design and the logic of each component. So, uh, so I'll have a quick demo of the Twitter sentiment uh, analysis stream flow right into Elasticsearch and view via Kibana. Uh, before that, I would um, like to uh, mention something is that um, Pylea is still in uh, its early development. And actually, there are a certain uh, storm core component is not yet supported by, by Pylos is like a Storm Trident for micro batch processing. Or, um, um, so if you want to use these features, then I guess you have to use the Java way. But if you want to use only the Storm core, Storm core components, then you can go ahead and use with Python. Um, another thing I like with Python is that 
as in the text uh, analytics functionalities, it's, it's, it's very hard to do in Java. It's, um, the, the packages and stuff like that in Python is like uh, you just import and, and uh, all these NLTK, uh, scikit-learns, and uh, text blob and things you can use immediately. So you don't have to worry about this. So uh, in this demo, um, I did a very basic app to do real-time Twitter sentiment analysis. Uh, Twitter gives you 500 million per day, and they give you 1% for free. Uh, so it would equal to about 58 per sec or something like that, which is not a lot, but um, can illustrate the point. But for Storm, uh, they can they have been proven to be able to handle millions of messages per second. Um, and I, I did a simulation test um, with only a, a basic bot, and it, it did handle about 1.5 million, which only a very basic uh, cluster setting of, of two machines. So, so millions of messages of seconds can be handled uh, with basic operations. But if you have more complicated operations, it's more how you really define this logic in the bot component. So in here, what I did is I take in the Twitter stream, and then I, uh, I have a bot to pre-process these messages to remove irrelevant uh, content. So that uh, it, it makes the sentiment score component computation later is more accurate. And then I write these um, raw text, uh, a few hashtags, and stuff like that, sentiment score into Elasticsearch. And then Kibana will pick up and visualize. So. Um, this is the uh, Storm UI web interface, as I have mentioned just now. It's for oh, oh, sorry. Okay, I'll drop it off over there. Okay, so this is the Storm UI. It's got cut a bit, right? Uh, it should be fine. Uh, I think it's got. Okay, um, then let me show down. Here it, it will give you some stat number and stuff like that. And uh, if there is any, any error or something, you will see here as well. What I normally do is that I go here to see the visualization of the topology. So this is a topology running in action, which has, as you see here, the spell. Twitter connector, the number in here is the latency of uh, this component. Then it goes to the preprocess, uh, which takes a bit more time, which go to computer sentiment score. In here, I did just some uh, basic regex thing. In here, I uh, basically call text blob library to compute sentiment score given the clean text of a tweet. And in here, I store into Elasticsearch. So by looking at here, you'll see uh, like what is the latency, and if it's really too high, you might want to optimize or separate that operation. And it, here, it will show you how, ma how many um, what is percentage of how how many uh, messages are going through this link in the past. I think ten minutes or something like that, or a minute. So this is throughput and latency. Here is the view. Uh, okay, so this is the last thing I want to show, is that after putting in Elasticsearch, I would be able to do with Kibana very easily to uh, to show the number of tweets. Uh, let me make it real time. Kibana, it allows you to set the intervals like minimum five seconds. <coughs> Here, so it will show you on this map. In the past one hour, refresh rate five seconds. How many um, how many tweets are coming up from a particular location? And uh, let me scroll down a bit. So, if you as you can see, the hot uh, the dot the red dots are the hot area with uh, more than two hundred or something in the past one hour. This is given the free one percent Twitter API data. Here, uh, below, here I did um, just some basic visualization of the sentiment score. 
So uh, on the left, we just count in how many, because I have the sentiment score and also the polarity of the tweet. So how many uh, positive and tw negative tweets coming in uh, in the past uh, one hour? Also, what are the top languages? Um, it refreshes every five seconds. So just now, I think you you can see that it, it, it did uh, yeah just now. So um, this is Kibana, which allow every five seconds uh, refresh. If you want something less than that, maybe you you can look at other solution. Um, now here is I extracted some of. Uh, the now phrases that appear in the positive and negative tweets uh, to illustrate that uh, the point that uh, with Python we can do this. Um, actually, I take in the tweets from any languages, and uh, Python I can connect to the um, Python text blob, which uh, uses the Google API translate, and then I can get this kind of thing um, really quickly, which I, I love about uh, text blob and LTK and those things. So uh, yeah, so with this demo, this is the end of uh, the data stream, um, the real-time stream processing talk. If uh, I think uh, we need to hand over to the next speaker soon. So if you need to ask me uh, anything, I'll be around during lunch time, and then I'll be off to the lab in the afternoon. So yeah, catch me at lunch time if you want to say something. But we do have time for one or two questions if anyone has them. Yes. Uh, very recently, uh, Twitter released an update to Storm called Parent. Uh, do you know anything about, because I, I haven't followed much of the news, do you know anything about what Storm's shortfalls were that Aaron's trying to address? Uh, I, unfortunately, I haven't heard about Hadron before, so uh, maybe now I can go back and look it up, but so yeah, I don't have like an answer. Oh yeah. Oh, then then I, I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry. All right. If you have any more. Nope. Otherwise, thank you, Kristen. Thank you.